Okay, so then this is chapter 2 under company law. So we are going to discuss with regard to effect of incorporation. So before this, I have discussed with you all what are the types of companies. Then we have gone through who actually is the person who take the initiative to form the company. So I have introduced to you promoters. So now you know that actually it is the promoters who is the one to take the initiative to form a company. And then I have discussed with you the pre-incorporation contract. What is the effect of this contract? Because we know before a company is being formed, of course there are certain steps need to be taken by the promoters so who, or whoever behind it so that once the company is being formed, it can run smoothly. And what is the effect of this contract which is entered by all these people? So we have gone through, uh, we know that uh, under our Malaysian law, this kind of contract which is being entered by uh, these, these people who formed the company, though that time the company is not incorporated yet, however, it can actually be ratified. And why it be ratified, then the company is of course to be liable. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so now we are going to go on, what is the effect of incorporation? Meaning once the company is being incorporated, so what is the effect of incorporating the company? What is the effect on the company? So we look at section 18, subsection 1, it says here, upon the date of incorporation, Specify in the notice of registration, we, we know that actually the date of incorporation is whatever date is being set inside the notice of notice of registration. And this notice of registration also we know actually is being issued under section 15 of the Communist Act. I have discussed all this with you earlier. So once this occur, meaning the notice of registration is out, uh, the company is said to be formed with the name which is being registered. And what is the effect? The effect is as what stated under Section 20 and Section 21 of the uh, Companies Act. So what is the effect of this? You can have a look here. So it has five effects. At the Lima Kesanya, the first one, of course under Section 20, the Companies will have legal personality, meaning now it is being separated from its members. The second one, to continue, will be in existence until it is being removed from the register, from the register. The third one, the company can sue and be sued, okay? And the fourth one, it can acquire, hold, develop or dispose of any property. And the final one, it can do any act which it may do or to enter into any other transaction. Okay, so actually, once a company is said to be incorporated, and we say that the company has legal entity, legal personality, so what is this actually? So of course, in our Malaysian law, we are going to uh, look through section 20 and, and 21, which I have discussed with you earlier. So however, just let us have a look in this old case of Sutton Hospital, whereby in that case, the judge says this, he says, the company, the corporate legal person is very different from the nature, from, from the nature of human legal person, so meaning that company have its own legal personality. However, of course, it's very different from us human beings. So what is the difference? It has neither body, mind nor soul. It does not have a brain. It does not have a soul. Okay? It does not have a body. It was said that it is invisible, immortal and rests only in the intentment and consideration of law. So meaning, the law created it. So, under that situation, because it does not have the mind, it does not have the soul, it does not have a body, how can actually a corporation commit treason nor be outlawed? So, meaning, how can a company do something which is against the law? Because it does not have the body, it does not have the intention, right? So, not as communicated, for they have no souls. A corporation is not subject to death of the natural body. So, this is... Uh, what is being said by the judge in the case of Sutton Hospital, Hospital, okay? So, actually, I'm going to discuss in detail with regard to section 20 and 21. So, just now, I have uh, highlighted to you section 28 where it says that once a company is being formed, now it has a separate legal personality or entity, okay? What does it mean that here? So it means that a company once it's being incorporated, it has a legal personality of its own. It's independent, it is independent of the person who comprises it. So in the company, of course, we have members. 
we have shareholder, we have the CEO, we have the director, we have the executive, we have all the staff, right? However, the company is independent from all these people. <coughs> so what, what is meant by this is, 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 is that as if there is a will separating the members and the company. And this will is known as the will of incorporation. Seolah-olah ada satu tirai yang memisahkan antara syarikat ini dengan orang-orang yang menggerakkannya di belakangnya. Okay? So, as if there is a will, of course there is no will. We said as if there is a will, we separate all these people, all the mem these members from the state com company. Okay. What are actually the case which establish this will of incorporation? So, once there is this separation, once there is will, so meaning, okay company, you are your staff and we all are our staff. You, whatever you do, you'll be liable. Whatever I do, I'll be liable. Okay. So mean, meaning that uh, meaning that uh, this is your business and this is our business. Okay. So we are not going to mix between the both the, between the two. So what actually the first case which established this uh, separate legal personality rule? Uh, the case is the case of Salomon vs Salomon and Company Limited. So why you put in Salomon and vs Salomon is this? This Mr Salomon he is a uh, sole trader of boots and shoe manufacturer. He was sole proprietor. He make boots, he make shoes, okay? And then later on, what he did, he formed a company with his wife and his son. So, and what he did, he also sell his business, this shoe manufacturing business to this company. And as consideration, of course, the company need, need, to, need to pay him because he, sell, he is selling something to the company, right? So how actually the company pays him? So the company pays him partly in cash, partly through share, so meaning he holds a share, he also receives money, and partly in the form of debenture. So you know what is a debenture? So it, a, a debenture is a form like a security loan, as if, as if, okay, so I'm, 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 I'm giving you the loan, so however you hold this uh, in the form of document, so meaning whatever happened, you have priority. So that's why I said, this is a security loan, it's being secured. So if we said that you are charging, if I wanted to obtain a loan from the bank, so the bank uh, requests me to mortgage a physical asset, uh, requests me to mortgage my property, my house. So I, uh, so the bank is a secured creditor, meaning if something went wrong, I cannot afford to pay the state loan. So my house is going to be auctioned off. So, however, in the case of a company, if let's say company they wanted to obtain more capital, so what they did, actually, this person who invest in the company, they are providing the company a loan in the form of this company, uh, this person who provide the loans being given a debenture, okay, and he holds the debenture, he becomes the debenture holders. So, this is very di different from this um, physical asset. Physical asset, you can touch it, you can see it. The form of the venture is not fixed, okay, it's not fixed, it depends on the uh, business of the company. So the good names of the company, okay, the, the business of the company, okay. So that's why uh, when somebody holds the venture, actually it's based on a floating charge. So the charge is not fixed, it's a floating charge, right. However, later on what happened, this company which is being formed by Mr. Solomon, it becomes insolvent. They bankrupt the bankrupt ni kan. And once the, the company becomes insolvent, most of the asset is used to pay the debenture. So remember what I told you just now, Mr. Solomon is the debenture holder, meaning he's a secure creditor, as if he is he's giving loan to the company, because the company cannot afford to pay to pay him. So what the company gave him is a debenture. So once the company becomes insolvent, all the asset of the company now is being auctioned off. And from the auction, the money is is it, it, used to pay Mr. Solomon because he holds the debenture, right? So, of course, under this situation, the other creditors, so orang yang bagi hutang-hutang yang lain dekat syarikat Solomon, they, of course, they are not satisfied. They say, all this is a sham. Semua ini dia kata tipu je belaka, right? It's a sham. So, however, the court held, tapi apa yang diputus kat oleh mahkamah? Court held actually in this case, in the, in, in the, in the, 
uh, Protest for Incorporation, the court said Solomon and the company is actually two separate persons. They are being separated. Even if the business was the same as before and it was still managed by Solomon, yeah, however, Solomon beneficially owned all the issued shares of the company, the court also recognized actually. Walaupun semua saham dia punya, dia control syarikat, dia yeah, control the, the company, all share belongs to him. However, the court said, the court also recognized actually, he is a separate person. Tapi mahkamah juga menerima bahawa dia adalah orang yang asing, he can become a secure creditor and he can enforce his right against the com- company. Uh. That is the first case which actually re- re- recognize this separate legal entity, the will of incorporation. And then this principle, which is being laid down by Solomon vs. Solomon, is being applied in the case of Lee vs. Lee Air Farming. So, in Lee vs. Lee Air Farming, it's quite similar with Solomon, whereby this Mr. Lee, he formed a company, he became the controller of the company, he is the shareholder of the company. And in fact, most of the share, he owns most of the share of the company except one. So what happened? He involved, um, he became the pilot of the company, he works with the company and he involved in, in the accident and he was killed. And then now, his wife wanted to claim this workman composition. In Malaysia, it's something like so so. However, the argument here is that Mr. Lee and the company, okay, uh, is actually the same person. And because of that, uh, uh, Mr. Lee is not titled actually to the composition. But what did the court help? The court help here, the court allows the wife claim. Court help actually, though Mrs. Mr. Lee controlled the company, though most of the shares belong to him. However, he is separated from the company. And he, since he is separated with the company, he and company actually is a separate legal entity, separate persons, he can work with the company. And because of that, the wife is entitled to the seat composition. Okay, that is in Lee versus Lee F. Amin. That is the first effect of incorporation. The second effect is this. The company have the ability to sue. Okay. And also be sued. Not only the company can sue, however, the company also can be sued. Okay. If let's say the rights of the company is being infringed, they have a right and have been infringed, of course, he can sue, right? However, if the company owns liabilities, we have liability towards others, then others can sue the com- the company. So, since the company is a separate legal entity and can be sued and can also sue, meaning the members of the company actually cannot um, take action on behalf of the company. Tak boleh lah orang lain yang ambil tindakan. Because actually, if the company actually, if let's say the company wanted to sue, if the company suffer damage, of course, they, they wanted to sue, okay? Then under that situation, again, who is actually the proper plaintiff? Of course, the person who suffered damage. In the case of Forrest versus Harbottle, I have discussed this case with you all earlier, whereby in this case, the minority shareholder sued the director. Why? Because it says the director, you mishandled the property of the company. But what did the court say? The court says actually who suffered damage. It is the company who suffered damage. Then under the situation, why he wanted to act on behalf of the company? Whoever suffered dam- damage, he is the one who's su- supposed to to file the said claim. So that's why in the case of force versus harbottle and the plaintiff loss. Because the court had you are not the right plaintiff. You are not, not the proper plaintiff to file this case. Okay, because you are not the one who suffered in theory. Okay, let us go on. The third one is perpetual succession. Meaning, a company is not like human being. Just now remember the case of Sutton Hospital, whereby the judge says this uh, corporate legal entity is not out. Like, we all human beings, we have soul, we have mind, we have body. Company does not have soul, does not have uh, mind, does not have body. And because of that, once the company is being incorporated, it will exist until it is dissolved according to the law or it's been struck out of the register. Once the law did not dissolve it, once it's not, it's, it's not struck off the, the register from CCM, then the company will still be in existence. It doesn't matter whether the director dies, whether the CEO is no more there, whether all the members die, the company will still exist. So that's why we say the life of a company is perpetual, sir, station, infinity. Tidak ada pun 
So let us have a look at the case of Renault Settlement Holdings, whereby this company have only two shareholders, the husband and the wife. And then um, the husband and the wife, they are also the company director. Then both of them involved in a tra traffic accident and they died. And uh, once they died, they have this infant child. So now what happened? Since they are the shareholders, they are the directors and both of them die. So does it mean that now the company also dies? The court held that the company still exists. Why? Because the court held that share in the company may be transferred to the child as the beneficiary. Okay, so that's what it says. Uh, the life of the company does not have an end. It's infinity. Okay, the fourth one, power to own property. This is under section 21, sub 1B. So it can own property under its own name and it can acquire, own, hold or develop or dispose of any property. The, the, the property of the company belongs to him. It does not belong to the members. Okay, it does not belong to the members. So even if, even if let's say, uh, the members hold all the share in the company, the company is not his actually. The asset of the company is also not, not his actually. Okay. So let's have a look at the case of Makara versus, versus Northern Assurance Company Limited first. What happened in this case? This Makara, he sold his timber to this company. And this company actually, all the share of the company owns by him. Similar like the case of Lee, similar like the case of Solomon versus Solomon. They are the controller of the company. They hold the share of the company. But what happened in this case? Which he sold to the company, the timber before that belongs to him, right? The timber was being assured under his name. And suddenly this timber, bala in it, tabaka. Uh, the timber caught fire. Fire occurred and all this timber is damaged. Now, now, so now, he wanted to claim insurance. What the court house? The court house, well, the insurance is under your name. It's your insurance. Whereas this timber, this timber belongs to the company. So, how can you claim something which is not yours? The timber that caught fire is not your timber. The timber which caught fire actually belongs to the company. So that's why in this case, Makara lost actually. Eh? He should have transferred the insurance under the company's name because since he have, since he have sold off uh, the timber to the company. So let us have a look in the case of mission case of Adu Aziz Atan Selada Ringo Malay Estate. So what happened of, in this case is this. This Landa Rango have changed its structure, the management structure, everything is changed. The shareholder have transferred their shares, so meaning now, now uh, new management, new shareholders. Okay? So, now the question is that whether there is a change in the employment agreement because this Adu Aziz Atan is an employee of this Landa Rango. And now he says now, since now everything is changed, his, his employer is no more there. So, meaning his employment agreement also is no more there. Right? And then because of that, he says he has the right to claim this pension benefit. Okay? So, however, what the court held? The court held whether, the, uh, whether there is a change of employment, the court said no, the company is still the same company. Though the structure, the management change, the shareholder change, however, the employer is still the same. Like UITM, it must change rector, change the VC. Okay, change all the club, the staff, everything changed. But UITM is still UITM. Okay, UITM is still there. The, the staff of the UITM is still the staff of UITM. So he is not entitled to this pension, pension scheme. So, okay, students, so let us go on with number, three, number five. So, whether a company can conduct other transaction. What kind of transaction? Because just now we said, okay, Company can own land, company can sue, be sued. This is what kind of transition? So a company also have have uh, have power to conduct transition like us human being. So of course, if uh, they, they they wanted to to start business, uh, example they need to rent a buildings, they need to enter into facilities agreement for electricity and water facilities, electrical telecommunication facilities. So all these can be done under the company's name. Can be done under the company's name. Okay? Uh, so this, they are being given power under section 21, subsection 1C. So meaning they can enter other transactions which a normal human being can enter under the law, though it's not mentioned 
Yeah, it's not though it's not mentioned under the Commerce Act. Okay, those transactions actually is a valid transaction. <coughs> so meaning the the the, the company can buy flat cat for his staff. The company can um you know handle program as a union program and so on. Okay. All the transactions and they can hire caterer and so on, event management. So all these are actually valid. All these are valid. So from the transaction, of course the company will incur liability, right? And this liability from all those transactions which is being conducted by the company actually is the liability of the company unless it is, it is being proven something else. So if let's say the company has unlimited capacity, and however under Section 35, if there is a constitution limiting the power of the company, limiting the capacity of the company, then of course the power of the company depends on this constitution. I will discuss about constitution with you later on, right? So meaning the company have to follow the constitution. If the constitution says the company can only do this, uh, if wanted to borrow money up to 1 million, so they can only borrow money up to 1 million, the company can only evolve the objective of the company is in regards only to education. Then they can, they can only evolve to education. Okay, they cannot go, uh, go beyond that, then it's wrong. So, for a company incorporated under the Commerce Act 1965, so before we have the Commerce Act 2016, and so we have this Commerce Act 1965, and at, at that time, it is a compulsory for all companies to have constitution. So, for this company, which has been formed before 2016, so all these companies, they have constitution, and if all those constitution is not amended yet, then these sections, will not apply. They need to follow the constitution. Section which says that, which says that the company has, has unlimited capacity will not apply. Why? Because they have constitution right. So if they have constitution, we are going to follow the constitution. Unless if they had amended their constitution. <coughs> so even if the company is an uh, unlimited co company, still the creditors, okay, cannot go direct to the to the members okay, and claim personally from the members this is wrong this is not allowed the creditor cannot proceed directly to the members because of the separate legal entity this now so the directors and officer of a company are not liable for the company's debt so this is what we shown in the case of reapplication by GUE in GUE he actually he started as a secretary of this wholly owned subsidiary of the US, US company. And then later on, he is being promoted and he becomes the, the, um, the manager, FDD director yeah, of the state company, the managing director of the state company, if I'm not mistaken. And then later on, this company start retrenching staff. Okay, start lah buang pekerja, right? And of course, once they retrench staff, industrial court, the union, the, um, the union for the employees, they will fight for their employees. Okay, of course lah, ya, kesatuan pekerja akan menuntut bagi pihak, pihak pekerja. And then the industrial court grant and order. Yeah. How, however, it seems the company now no more in existence in Malaysia. Yeah, so they now go against whom? They goes against this EUT, who is the now the managing that director. However, court held actually, court held actually that this director is not liable for the debts of an incorporated company. Except... It can be proven that it's a case of fraud, breach of warranty, or any other exceptional cases, which I will discuss with you later on. Okay? If not, then of course the company is the one who will be liable under that situation. Okay? We have discussed these three very main, very important cases. We have to have a look at the case of Solomon vs. Solomon. So in Solomon vs. Solomon, okay? What does he say? Okay. In Solomon vs. Solomon, we know that. This whole proprietor, he formed a company, the share belongs to him, he controls his company, he can't say they're a separate legal entity. And because of that, he can become a debenture holder, right? He, he, he can become a debenture holder, meaning he can become a creditor to the state company. And in the case of Lee, quite uh, similar to Solomon and Solomon, I will do the court help here. He can, he can work with the company, he can become an employee. And if he, he the court help, actually, the staff of the company, 
is not liable for the company's debts because of the separation of power just now. And you cannot go against the staff. Right? You cannot go against the action of the company. Okay? So now, let us have a look at the lifting of the corporate whale. So just now, generally I told you, as if there is a whale of incorporation okay, separating the members and also the, the company. So what is this? This is an exception to that general rule which I have discussed with you earlier. This is an exception. What does I mean that this is an exception? Okay? So why we have this rule just now? That rule just now is being implemented to protect members actually. Okay? However, there are situations when the law allows actually uh, the, the law allows actually this whale to be penetrated. Okay, we wanted to look actually who is behind the whale. So this these are the situations where it involves uh, fraud and the situation the controllers of the company will be made liable. So these are the circumstances, circumstances I, I, I written down there. The court will set aside the separate legal personality rule to look to the members or controllers of the company. This is known as listing of the will. Okay? Especially uh, when we wanted to make them liable for what they have done. So we are going to go on this uh, listing of the will which is being allowed under our own Companies Act. We are going to look at our, our, our own statute. So under section 75, subsection 4, and 75, subsection 5, allotment of shares. Okay? So, if a shares need to be issued, so of course, the objective to issue share is actually to raise capital. Okay? And, director cannot simply issue share. Of course, there are procedures which they need to follow before share can be issued. If, let's say, they have issued the shares without following this procedure, then under that situation, uh, the said person who do that will be made liable. So if you read here, say, any director who knowingly contravenes, meaning he contradicts with this provision, or permits authorize the contribution of or fails to take all reasonable steps to prevent this contravention, dia tak buat apa-apa, dia biar je pelanggaran tu berlaku, then he shall be liable, then dia akan dipertanggungjawabkan untuk membayar ganti rugi kepada syarikat. Shall be liable to compensate the company and the person to whom the share will issue for any loss, for any damages or cost which the company or that person may have sustained. Maka siapa yang akan dipertanggungjawabkan ke section ini? Maka orang yang membiarkan ini berlaku. Of course, it is the director. So this is what happened in the case of Howard Smith. I'm going to discuss this Howard Smith when we discuss the topic of directors. Yeah? In Howard Smith was the for Petroleum, the director issue shares not to raise capital actually. They issue shares to reduce and for Petroleum share holding. So this is wrong. Yeah, this is wrong and this is not allowed. Okay. This is the second exception under the Complete Act. Misstatement in prospectus. What is the prospectus? I think I have, I have um, briefly mentioned this to you uh, when we were discussing uh, the promoter's duties, if not mistaken. And under section 167, subsection 1 of the Commerce Act, if there is a misstatement of the prospectus, and then uh, because of that, okay, the investor suffer damages. Who will be made liable? Well, because investors, before they invest, of course, they will have a look at the prospectus. They wanted to know, of course, uh, what actually the prospect of these companies, whether this company is a viable company, whether the company can gain profit in the future. So let's say if any of the statement in the prospectus is misleading, right? That's why we say misstatement, right? because the information is not right. Who will be liable? Who will be liable to all these investors? <coughs> <coughs> I have underlined the most important the people who will make liable so they can recover the amount of loss of damage from whom? from the corporations and each director of the corporation at the time of the issue of the prospectus okay who are the director? at the time when the prospectus is being issued that director will be liable and the person who consented to be named as director at that particular time and also the prom promoter okay 
who actually is one of the party who 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 involved in the preparation of the prospectus and other person who consented that their statement be included inside the prospectus and also the person who authorized the issuance of such prospectus. You see, all these people will be made liable. Yeah, because why? Because the prospectus actually is a fraud. Right? Okay. So now yeah, let's go on to it for this. Number three. Section 224, subsection 6, and 228, subsection 5. This is loan to directors and transaction with directors, subsection shareholders, or connected person. So, I've taught you the types of companies, you can still remember. What did I taught you? I said, only exempt private company can give loans to directors, right? Public company, of course, cannot. So, that's why this section said, when loan guarantee or security in favor of director, without approval of the company through a resolution. So, if a loan is to be provided, it must be through this resolution. And if it's not so, then who will be made liable? Why you give loan to these people, right? Then under that situation, this loan will be white and uh, who are and they are to account to the company for any gain and to indemnify the company for any loss. If they gain from that, they need to pay back to the company. If if the company suffer loss, they also need to pay compensation to the company yeah, because they did this. So okay, then uh, this is section two three zero subsection subsection six of the Commerce Act, Office of Directors. So I have taught you also if you can still remember. When I was, uh, I was, and when I was differentiating between a private company and a public company, what did I told you? I, I told you that fees of directors for a private company will be determined according to the constitution. However, if this is fees of directors of a public company, how will it be determined? For a public company, the def, the fees of directors or any benefit payable to directors, including the compensation for loss of employment of a formal director, then what will happen? It needs to be approved at the general meetings, meaning the shareholders need to approve it. Okay? Uh -huh. So this is what happened in the case of Radio Motic Limited. They pay the formal director's compensation because of loss of office. So the situation is similar like in Malaysia. Okay, this go against the statute there and because of that, who make the payment now is being made liable. Need to pay back the company. Okay? Okay, number five, this is section 540, subsection 1 of the Commerce Act, fraudulent trading. Ni urus niaga yang bersifat penipuan. Okay? So let's say the commerce is being wind up. Companies ni di berlaku penggulungan syarikat. Bankrupt lah. Okay? And it feels that the business, that the company is doing all this while, is how the business try to defraud the creditors. So that's why it becomes creditors. Okay? Or maybe some other person that under that, that situation, any person who knowingly a party to it, mana mana orang yang tahu kenaan dengan ini, he will be made personally liable. So let's have a look in the case of Chin Chi Kiong was a stalling corporation. The stalling corporation sued the company because failure to pay for plastic resins supplied and uh, supplied to the state company, uh, to the state uh, uh, to the state company, and then they obtain judgment. However, the company then failed to pay the judgment sum. Then they sued the director. The the court held actually that that shows that it's an intention to defraud the plaintiff, and because of that, yeah, the plaintiff succeeded in their claim. <coughs> okay, so number six, this is prohibition to act in dual capacity. So what does it mean in dual capacity? So later on, I'm going to teach you about auditors. So an auditor cannot become the director of the company or cannot have anything to do with the company. <coughs> because why? Because under that situation, we hold two posts. That is a conflict of interest. This is actually wrong. If, if that is the situation, then whose interest he is going to give property? So it's the same thing if a person is, let's say, a director, uh, in, a director of Shell and at the same time is director of Petronas. This is wrong. Because why? Because these two kind of business, they actually connected to each other. So if actually they become director of two companies who, who is not related at all 
So let's say he's the director of Petronas and at the same time he's also a director of uh, so what are the big company? Whatever like telecommunication, Maxis or whatever. So they are not related. Let's say they are not related, right? So under that situation, then only it will be allowed. Okay? So now, let us go with number seven, distribution when no profit. <coughs> so let's say the company does not make any profit, right? The company does not make any profit and still they wanted to pay dividends to the shareholders. This is not allowed. So, the director or manager of company who willfully, willfully permits or allows this to happen, then under the situation, if let's say, suddenly the company go into liquidation, then under that situation, the creditors can sue all these people. So, Tabung Haji, I think around 2016, 2017, this is issued raised by Bank Negara, whereby Tabung Haji actually, they paid dividend to to their members, whereas at that particular time, they did not actually make profit. Uh, however, why then you ask, I think student will be asking me, why actually no action is being taken against all these directors? Well, under that situation, Tabung Haji is still surviving. So here I say, if, uh, if let's say, uh, the, the company goes into liquidation, I will the case of Tamu Haji, but Tamu Haji is still survive, surviving. Okay, number seven. Number eight, this is Income Tax Act 1967. Okay, so power to disregard certain transactions. So let's say there is any arrangement. Ya? Adalah pemuafakatan lah untuk lari dari cukai. Ya? Tax avoidance arrangement. If there is any arrangement to avoid tax, so either by altering any statement or relieving or evading or hindering. Sama. So maybe cuba mengelak kan uh, from pembayaran cukai then under that situation and under that situation the person who actually does that will be held liable. So they may, maybe not the directors, they may be the auditor or maybe the accountant of the said company. Okay? Okay. So number nine, this is power of court to accept damages against delinquent officers. Officers who actually commits wrongdoing against the company. So if in the case of winding up, uh, dalam case-case uh, uh, penggulungan syarikat, like one MDB, one MDB, I'm not so sure at the moment, there is, there is no winding up process yet, right? However, let's say if there is a winding up process, and it appears that there are officers who actually is a misconduct, okay? Two years before the winding up process, they commit the wrongdoing against the company. Then the company that took, uh, that too can actually um, claim uh, towards this officer. So this is actually known as um, uh, tracing back. Tracing back. Boleh jejak lagi lah dua tahun sebelum bankrap sebelum pengurusan syarikat mesti boleh menjejaki officer officer ini. So they will be liable. Mereka akan dipertanggungjawabkan. So, the last one, the last one, under exception under our statute, we have many other exceptions. However, I highlight only this stand yeah, for your purposes. So, number 10 is the section 46 of the Employees Provident Fund Act 1991, whereby in the case of failure to contribute to EPF, the employer failed to contribute to EPF, then the directors will be made jointly and very liable for the contribution due to EPF akan dipertanggungjawabkan secara bersama dan berasingan ok uh, terhadap EPS so this is what happened in Hadi Billy and others susun lembaga kepulauan sepanah pekerja so what happened in this case this company fails to contribute to EPF gagal untuk membuat pemotongan dan penyumbangan kepada EPF and PF took action against one director only ok however court held actually the other directors will also be personally liable even though they are sleeping partners or non-active partners. Eh, sorry. Even though they are sleeping directors or non-active directors. Sorry, student. We are not discussing with regards to partnership. We are not on company law, right? So, what did the court have? The court have whether these directors are sleeping directors or whether they are non-active directors, they will still be personally liable during the relevant period when they were directors. Meaning, during that period, right? During that period, if you have not 
was not paid any expectation since during that period you are a director, you are personally liable. Okay, student, so that is the situation under our law, under our statute. So what happens uh, under common law, the English law? How does it look like? Does they have this uh, exception just like our statute? Ada tak dorang pengecualian macam undang-undang di Malaysia? So, under the common law, court also permit this lifting of the veil. Mahkamah juga membenarkan ya, singkap kira ini you know, on the, uh, public uh, policy grounds. So, there is no specific test actually. Tak adalah satu test yang specific. However, case law where veil is being lifted, this will be an example of, and also a guideline for us okay, uh, to look at what are the situation when the, leg, when the veil of incorporation is being lifted. The first situation under the common law, when the common is being used to evade legal obligations, they gunakan syarikat ini untuk lari pertanggungjawab undang-undang. Okay? So maybe they make use of the company to disguise certain fraud. Uh, to enable this person to evade from his legal obligation. Okay, the penipuan, dan nak lari dari tanggungjawab undang-undang, itu bukan satu syarikat. Well, well, this is wrong to me. So, let us have a look at the case of Jones versus Lehman. So, why happen in Jones versus Lehman is this. Lehman had actually agreed to sell his house to Jones. Suddenly, he changed his mind. He don't want to sell his house, the, the said house. However, he had already entered into that contract. So, now, how... Uh, how he wanted to avoid from transferring the said house to Jones. He formed a company and he transferred this house to the said company. So when Jones wanted to seek for specific performance, kita dah buat bawah contract, specific performance. So when a party is being forced to perform the contract. So when Jones wanted to do this, he said that, well, it's not that I don't want to transfer the house to you. So now the house is not mine, now the house now belongs to the company. Okay? So under the situation, what did the court have? Okay, the court had <coughs> the company was creature creature of Lipman. Company tu dia yang buat, maluk yang dia buat, a device and a sham satu alat yang nak menipu a mask which hold before his face and attempt to avoid the eyes of equity. Maka orang kata semuanya tipu belaka. Satu topeng untuk menutup penipuan tu and because of that, both Lehman and also the company were ordered specifically to perform the contract by selling the house to, to Jones. It took the case of Jones' Lehman. So let us have a look at the case of Gilford Motors. They are still under the same topic and the same discussion. However, in this case, Horn actually, he is the formerly amending the director of the productive preventive company, Gilford Motor. He combinated Dia buat satu perjanjian with the company, with his employer that he will not solicit customers of the company after uh, uh, his termination employment. Kata kalau dah berhenti kerja, saya takkan caras lah. Takkan caras, takkan curi lah you punya customers lah. This is what he agreed. He will not uh, make sure, he will make sure that he will not solicit. He will not uh, uh, try to, you know, take the uh, client, customer belong to the same company. So, however, when he left the company, he formed another company by the name of Horn and Company Limited. Yes, he is not the one who solicited this customer, but the company did. Horn and Company Limited did. So, what is the argument? He said, it's not me who, who, who did that. It's the company, the company and me, we are being super, separated. What the court had? The court granted the injunction. Eh, Mahkamah membenarkan perintah larangan ini. Yeah, a clause the injunction not against Horn and also against his company. Now you cannot solicit customer anymore. Okay, and number one. So number two, company as agent or alter ego of its controllers. Uh, ini adalah apabila company ini adalah agent ataupun ya yeah, uh, personality yang lain. Eh, the other personality of the controllers. Actually, you are the, you are the same. Uh, you see, you are the same actually, right? So where the company is employed as an agent of its controllers, the principals are liable for the company's act under the normal principle of agency. So let us have a look at the case of Smith, Stone and Knight Limited versus Birmingham Corporation. Birmingham Corporation. So what happened in this case, this land actually, which is being occupied the company, however, the business which is operated on the land is being operated by the subsidiary company, which is Birmingham. Corporation, uh, uh, 
buy the subsidiary and then Birmingham Corporation actually the local authority there eh? kalau kat Malaysia ni kita kata majlis perbandaran dewan bandaraya local authority right that is Malaysia however over there this is Birmingham Corporation they wanted to acquire the land dia buat nak buat pengambilan tanah so of course now the company claim compensation and because they want to acquire my land of course you need to pay compensation right however the claim is this state that under the English law only owner occupier is really is entitled to claim for compensation. So under this situation, it says the land is the owner is somebody else and is being occupied by somebody else. However, what the court heard? The court heard that not only the land but the business of the subsidiary still belong to the holding company. Uh, so meaning actually they are the same. Uh, the business is the business of the holding company. Okay. Um, so land also belongs to the holding company okay uh, so yang itu boleh dapat pampasan number tiga number three where the company is a sham or a mere fake counseling the true the true facts <coughs> <coughs> so kena kata when the company is a sham satu kepura-puraan ya apabila ia is, is only a disguise this guy is trying to conceal the true facts. Okay. So once we have the separate legal entity rules, sometimes, most of the time, it has been abused by companies, by, by, by the directors of companies, yeah, because they're trying to hide something. So this should be a disguise uh, for them to commit an offense. Okay. So a company may be formed as a prime to hide the true state of affairs. So that's why I said sometimes it's been made as an abuse because of this general rule so under the situation if there is the situation the court might disregard its correctness of powers and treat that the company and the members as one so what is being uh, stated by the judge the lord keith in wilson who says strike like regional council he said here it is appropriate to pierce the corporate way only where special circumstances exist indicating that it is a mere package concerning the true facts. Dia kata kalau dah is a disguise, satu penyamaran, ah, bolehlah kita nak pierce, menembusi tirai tersebut. So let us have a look in the case of Rebugger Press Limited. So two of the shareholders of the company, so they have actually 9,000 share of the company. So meaning they are the majority shareholders. So what they did here, they wanted to buy the third, the third uh, shareholder from the shareholder. However, he refused to to sell it off. So what they did, they formed a company and then <coughs> they formed a company. What they did, um, they transferred their share, all their share to the said company. And then because under these. Uh, uh, statute there and the statute there if a company holds a majority share then they have the right to acquire the share of the minority so meaning now the uh, third shareholder he only have 10 percent and that's why it makes this company can acquire his share however what the court have the court have although the law have been complied betul lah no no memang betul cakap macam tu you dah ikut right statute says okay syarikat yang berangkan majority boleh ambil alih Saham daripada minority. However, the court had, it was obvious, it was sangat jelas, that the company was formed to hide the true intention of the members. The true intention of the two, two shareholders just now. So, number four, this is where the court is asked to exercise equitable, equitable discretion. So there are situations when the court will use their own discretion, whether they wanted to uh, leave the way or not, and to ignore the separate legal entity role in certain circumstances. So Munda Equity too will not be blinded by any corporate mass that a person may hold before his face to shield him. Sometimes people, you know, they form a company as a shield, sebagai perisai saja, nak menutup kesalahan dia, kan? So this principle, principle whereby the court actually will set, will, will leave the way most of the time will justify a marewa injunction. So what is a marewa injunction? This is an injunction whereby the asset will be freeze, an order whereby an asset will be freeze 
an antipolar order. Antipolar order is the right to search certain premises without obtaining a notice or without giving notice to the <coughs> to the to the owner. So uh, you 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 do not know suddenly people comes to your house, okay, and conduct a, a search without a warrant. Why? Because they already uh, already obtained this antipolar order, okay. So under these situations, uh, especially when it involves fraud, the court will allow this. So let us have a look at the case of Akhwat Rasinia Berhad versus Bank Bumutra Misha Berhad. This is a quite an old case. Okay, what happened is that this Lorraine, Lorraine here already passed away in England. So actually he is the director of Bank Bumutra Misha Berhad. And at the same time, he is also the chairman of the subsidiary of Bank Bumutra, which is Bumutra Malaysian Finance. Now, Bank Bumutra is suing Lorraine saying that he's making secret profit while he holds the office of, of director and chairman. So an application for Mareva injunction then was made to restrain Lorraine from transferring his asset out of jurisdiction. So satu uh, perintah menghalang dia daripada memindah milikkan harta-harta dia ke luar negara. Uh, perintah tu ada kan? So what, what Lorraine did later on Lauren transferred all the share to his company, which is Akpatra. He said, now, okay, this bank Bimutra now is seeking an injunction to be extended towards Akpatra. Nak tahan lah Akpatra, kan? Tahan an injunction. And then, and then Akpatra challenged it. Where well, Lauren and Akpatra, we are not the same person. This is a separate legal entity. We have nothing to do with Lauren. Okay, so however, what the court had, the court held that it could leave the corporate will in in order to determine whether the asset of the company was really owned by them, betul tak asset itu Akpatra punya, or whether Lauren had abused the principle of the separate legal entity. Ataupun, ya, yeah, separate legal entity ini disalahgunakan oleh Lauren. The court found actually the fact that yeah, uh, Lauren is the alter ego. The other party actually is Lauren. Lauren is really the person behind it. Uh, so, dapatlah uh, perintah injunction tadi. So what about group companies? You know, like UITM, we have uh, the main main office, UITM Shalang, and then we have a lot of branches, right? Uh, so these are group lah, in the group group companies. So in certain situation, a group of companies may be created as one single corporate entity and a single economic entity. So let us have a look in the case of Hotel Jaya Puri, our National Union of Hotel Board and Restaurant Workers. Whereby, what happened in this case, student, this is our last topic for today, okay? Before I go on the constitution, the next chapter. So, <clears throat> what happened in this case? This restaurant, actually, is a subsidiary of uh, Hotel Jayapuri, and they retrenched their staff, their worker, and the, the restaurant was closed down. So now, you know, during the COVID-19, a lot, a lot of this situation occur, right? So this is what happened to Hotel Jayapuri. The restaurant was closed down and the, work, the worker was mainly trash, they lost their job. So, and then the union, union for the worker, claim of course, yeah, claim against the um, employer. Yeah. However, who is the employer? Because the, the, the restaurant is no more there, okay? Because it's no more in existence, they have been closed down. However, the hotel is still in existence. However, the court held that, although technically, the subsidiary and the hotel were two separate entities, in reality, actually, they are one company, and because of that, the hotel will be liable. They are the one which who will be liable to pay compensation to the to the workers of the restaurant. Okay, students, so thank you. Until you, I see you again uh, during the next class on our topic on constitution. Thank you, students. So bye bye.